There was an upside down American flag in front of one of the Lido's houses. What is the originalist position on trying to imprison the front runner <laughs> political candidate from the opposition party? I was radicalized once or a couple of times, actually. I'd love to be radicalized. I tried yeah. on every few years. He's like, what, what if you guys get all these different YouTube content creators? And it's like, dude, he, they can just go to YouTube for that. Only seven to eight EV chargers have actually been built. How is it possible that you guys received $7.5 billion to build these EV chargers and you've built fewer than 10? I don't know how we persist in this world of just failed policy after failed policy and more money printed and nothing gets better. It has to change eventually, right? Like there has to be a moment where we stop. I feel like it's even more depressing than how you're describing it. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> What's up, guys? Welcome back to the pod. I want to talk just like immediately out of the gate, especially because we have, I think we have a scoop. Um, we got to talk about the Alito flag controversy, which sounds and maybe even presents classically as incredibly stupid. This is, if you really just boil it down, a controversy over not just one, but, but two flags. Uh, but I do think there's an important sort of piece of the puzzle here, which concerns the future of the American presidency and the courts. So let's talk about it. Uh, last week, the controversy blew up over a pine tree flag discovered in front of uh, Alito's house. It actually had happened a couple of years ago, but the New York Times wrote about it. I believe it was last week or, or was it two weeks ago? The story really begins in January 2021 when there was reporting on a different flag in front of Alito's house. So directly following what some would allegedly call, not me, and not the New York Times, by the way, so I'm safe, uh, an insurrection, there was an upside down American flag in front of one of Alito's houses. It's, I think the, Sanjana, was it the one, is it the, is it the, it's, I feel like there's, he has like a rich, like a Virginia house. It's the Virginia house. Yeah, I believe so. It's, it's like the nice in Virginia Arlington? house. So he's got this upside down flag. Um, now, years later, everyone's like, this is a pro-insurrection flag. He's like, no, 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 it's not. Um, it's just because we later learn my wife got in a fight with some neighbors. And so she turned the flag upside down, which I mean, we could talk about in a minute. I don't fully understand that. I I'm curious. I would like to know more. Maybe you guys know more. Um, but for me, where the thing really comes to life is this fucking pine tree flag. So... <laughs> This is the, uh, with the appeal to heaven flag, the pine tree flag. This is a flag that George Washington flew back during the revolution. It's a flag that's been popular among, it's a flag that's been popular among small C conservatives for at this point, like hundreds of years. Uh, and it reminds me really a lot of the Gadsden flag, which is that, um, join or die flag that became really popularized or repopularized in the John Adams, uh, sort of mini series on HBO that blew up a handful of years back. Uh, it became associated with the Tea Party because it's like a sort of live free or die type flag. Uh, I myself loved it. And I remember even back then with the Gadsden flag, it was like you had a lot of journalists trying to link it to truly nefarious concepts to sort of demean the entire movement of people who just wanted lower taxes, really, is what like that flag was all about. Uh, and, and I think that this specific flag, which was flying in front of Alito's house, it gives a lot of the same energy and it has a lot of the same sort of historical importance and has for years and years and years. Now, the broader picture here, why did the New York Times write an enormous, exhaustive piece written by, th there are three bylines on this fucking flag piece, um, to uh, uh, demean or not demean, to I guess malign Alito as uh, a bad flag waiver, it's because that flag, which they're trying to now associate with treason, um, in front of Alito's house means that Alito should have to recuse himself from January 6th related trials uh, featuring the president of the United States. And so sort of my 
before we get into the actual flag stuff, my take of what's really happening here is just boil down to its basics. You have a lot of really powerful people on the Democratic Party side who want to prevent someone who is currently leading in the polls in the race for the presidency from running. They want to prevent the front runner candidate from running. And they want to do this because they feel that he is a danger to democracy. So just like one more time slowly, we are subverting democracy in the name of saving democracy. I think it's super fucked up. To make it stick, they have to do crazy things like this. And what we just discovered, I just discovered a moment ago when I was Googling around, I was curious. Um, I'm always curious at the definitions of things and the sort of um, like encyclopedia entries of things and the way that they change in real time in the middle of heated moments. I went and checked out the Appeal to Heaven Flags Wikipedia page and I toggled over to the edits. There have been more edits on this flag, this flag's page in the last month, not even month, just since the New York Times piece came out on Sancho. You said it was the 22nd of May, I believe. Yeah. Um, there have been more edits since the 22nd of May than there have been to that page in the preceding eight years, over the preceding eight years combined, okay? More <laughs> edits to that fucking flag in less, uh, over a week than eight years. Um, that says to me that we're in the middle of an information war. I think it's really interesting and uh, I want to know what you guys think about it. Well, I'll also say the edits, if you look at the revision history, um, the edits go from basically these kind of minor uh, like clarification of information, uh, tweaking quote formatting to all of these clarifications, quote unquote, about modern usage uh, and, you know, squabbles over whether or not something is uh, not representing a neutral point of view and all these different things. So it's this is what happened to Amy Coney Barrett in her Supreme Court justice here in her hearing for the Supreme Court justice, where she used the phrase sexual preference. And then in real time, a piece goes up saying that we don't use that phrase anymore. It's bigoted. Um, the definitions of these uh, of that phrase then changes uh, immediately following the piece, right? It's like clearly you have people who are politically motivated editing this stuff. We see it again and again and again. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just like classic information war stuff. So I'm sorry I cut you off there. I mean, I was just going to say, like, I think we, we will get into the clownish details of like the Alito specific <laughs> neighbor squabble, I guess at some point, but I've never understood. I think you're right. Like this is clearly a certain faction of the political left is trying to employ like every tool in their arsenal to try to get Trump off the ballot. And I've really never understood this recusal argument uh, at all because the the claim is that, so basically they're trying to get Alito to, to not vote on this uh, case that's related to Trump where they're trying to like invoke this white collar crime statute that dates back to Enron uh, to prosecute some of the January 6th rioters or whatever. Um, and the idea is that like maybe if they, if they, can say that they can use this statute, then Trump could also be implicated uh, in in the crime. Um, but it's like weird to me that they think that the justices don't all already have like a preconceived idea about whether <laughs> or not the 2020 election was influenced by unfair mail-in ballots or anything like that. Like this whole idea that just because Alito or his wife flew a flag that somehow like he's going to be more biased than like Sonia Sotomayor or something just doesn't make any sense. Um, I've always thought like recusal makes sense in cases where, you know, the judge maybe has like a financial interest in the defendant or the plaintiff or something. If it's, if it's that kind of case or if they know if they personally have a relationship with the defendant. Um, but it's, it's like such a stretch and yet they keep like bringing up these weird tabloid stories uh, and trying to legitimize them with insane quotes, which we can get into. But uh, yeah, that's it sort of, is yeah. really interesting because the illusion of the neutral judge has not really existed for a long time, right? I mean, this is what the war is always about. This is... Ev this is Every single house is totally divided now on the question of whether or not 
to to say yes to a justice. That's new. That wasn't like this 30 years ago. Okay. Like this is a very new, this is the, the war is clearly happening in the courts. This is where legislation is being really, it's like not supposed to be, but that's where legislation is happening now. And these people are all totally partisan. Um, I mean, you know what? I'm biased. So maybe that's where this comes. I, I clearly, I'm in favor of a more traditional reading of the law. I like the concept of justices who really try to just understand what was meant by the law. Maybe I'm a little bit naive in that I think that that could still exist. I do feel like the ACBs of the world um, are a little closer there than, I mean, Sotomayor seems fucking crazy to me. Um, that's just like a college activist. As I see her, I don't see any. Whereas Kagan, who I often come down on the on the wrong side, like we, I disagree with her all the time. I don't know. I guess maybe I am just naive because I'm like I feel like she she she's more, I guess, integrity adjacent than some of the the newer ones. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I feel like Alito. You you know, you're getting originalism with him. Like he's not. I, I don't know the sort of implication that like somehow he's gonna what put out like a specious legal argument because his wife put up this flag just doesn't make sense. I mean, he's going to put out an originalist argument uh, most likely. And so it's, yeah, it's just so weird. Um, what is the originalist position on trying to imprison the front runner <laughs> political candidate from the opposition party directly before an election? I'm sure it's complicated. I'm sure there is like, it, yeah. you know what? They're going to do the work. They're going to, they're going to look into it. Brandon, what do you think about all this? Before we get into the actions, I do, we have to actually talk about the flag. The, the upside down one really just the story is my mind. Like Sanji, I'm kind of mystified by the, what, what logic is at play here? I, I really don't think that. So first there's no legal mechanisms for getting a justice to recuse themselves from a decision. So it's not like this is going to, sort of all culminate in some kind of like congressional hearing where uh, Alito is just forced not to vote on some Supreme Court case that concerns Trump and, and allowing him to run. Um, it seems just like a really unserious sort of attempt to, I don't know, shame Alito, who, who's not going to be shamed because he really had nothing to do with any of this anyways. Because it's all his like weird wife and well, these two alleged tarts who moved in their mom's house <laughs> down you know the what? street. Tell, tell the story of this <laughs> Brandon, go explain off. to us how this flag <laughs> turned upside down because now we're talk not talking about the, the the pine tree flag which again was like a, a normie boomer conservative flag up until a week ago apparently but the upside down american flag is strange to me okay she mrs alito turned the flag upside down the normal american flag that they have she turned it upside down because that is traditionally a symbol of dis of like the country in distress. And is that okay? That is. It's a, it's actually in the U.S. flag code. Unless GPT is hallucinating to me right now, like there is a code Which for it the was. U.S. flag. It really was after January sixth. Whether was, or not yeah, you enjoyed it, was, it sure, it's a different yeah, question. You didn't have to read it as like a conservative thing, though. It seems pretty conservative to do that. Um, but I I was under the impression that that's why she did that. But um, I think in the, the like I like you said, Solana, she maybe had done it because she was reacting to these neighbors. I don't know. Do you do you know Sanji? Like I'm kind of confused about. Well, that's the uh, there there, that came up today. I it. saw in in news there was this weird detail about her her she had this like theater woman <laughs> yeah. in her 30s who moved back home. And yeah. had a boyfriend, and the two of them were Nathan. super angry about politics, and yeah. <laughs> they were like always taunting them with signs and stuff. But then I don't know what that has to do with an upside down flag. In the New York Times two days ago, um, so yeah, because the the upside down flag was displayed outside the the Alito residence uh, in in 2021, and but and and everyone assumed this was in reaction to the quote unquote insurrection. But this piece now says, um, so this is from the New York Times, during the gloomer, gloomy summer of COVID summer of 2020, this woman who was a 35 year old actor and restaurant server in New York moved to her mother's home in Alexandria, really which server. is where the Alito. Yeah, okay. You already know she sucks. You already know. <laughs> if you say actor and restaurant server, you're actually a server. Sorry, but go ahead. But also true. <laughs> um, so she and her boyfriend, uh, I guess, moved 
into her mother's house. Uh, I guess they're in their thirties. Um, there's a lot of color in here. They adopted a pandemic puppy. They took walks around the neighborhood. They provided company for this woman's mom. <laughs> And they were also really into Black Lives Matter. Um, so they like used their ripped up Amazon Prime boxes to uh, like put up fuck Trump signs and things like that. And I guess this really antagonized Mrs. Alito, um, who apparently like pulled up next to them in a car and glared at them. And uh, they may or may not have exchanged words. And then you know, a few days later, the upside down flag is hanging outside of the Alito residence. And so it's unclear whether or not the upside down flag was in reference to January 6th, or if it was just to piss off the aspiring actor, uh, actress, sorry, down the street. Um, but it's definitely, I think, important context. <laughs> I just don't know why you would do that I just don't know why you would do that in response to a fight. Like, I, I just don't know what she's proving there. I could understand. Here's the, the two scenarios I could understand. I could, and they're both sort of about the insurrection. So I could understand in response to the insurrection, not even necessarily supporting the insurrection, but just saying, whoa, given Brandon's context on what the flag meant, whoa, it's the nation's in distress. Cool. Got it. Um, I could also understand having an exchange with the annoying mid thirties theater woman, theater woman about politics that was so tedious and obnoxious to you that it made you want an insurrection. And then you go and you turn the flag upside down. You're like, you know what? We're bringing Trump back. We're going to, we're going to give them something to be <laughs> really mad about. Um, and I mean, maybe in like in a moment, it was a heated moment. She thought maybe for a second she wanted an insurrection. I wouldn't hold it against her. And I certainly wouldn't hold it against her husband. The real story here is like the, <laughs> the mom, you know, the mom, the, this baby. So this 35 year old millennial lived hard. She, <laughs> she's living at her mom's house. She's doing all of this at her mom's house. So she went and like blew up her whole, her mom's whole social scene, in my opinion. That's probably what happened. So she like moves in with her boyfriend to this house. And then she starts putting up these tacky signs, one of which says, fuck Trump, on her mom's lawn. And her mom is even in the New York Times saying, I didn't really like the signs, but like they, you know, she was being a good mom. I'd be like, but they had good intent. So I let them keep it up. <laughs> and then so they get in this antagonistic fight with the Alitos or with Mrs. Alito. And they create all this conflict between basically the mom's neighbor and the, the kids and then when Roe v. Wade drops, of which Alito wrote the opinion, oh boy. they went out and protested outside of his house. Like, it's so cringe. I would be so embarrassed if I was the mom, you know? that's I feel like that's that's the real victim here is the mom. Yeah, who's just silently bearing it all. Yeah. I mean, she's also support... They're in her house. So we know what kind of kids these are in their I, 30s who are living with mom. I think um, when I go to my mom's... I'm like, I still feel like a guest, you know, like I would never do anything like that. You know, I, I respect the fact that she's letting me stay in her house. It's, she's my mom and she would let me stay in her house until the day I died. But like, I would never feel so entitled to her house that I would start putting up fucking political signs in her yard. Like that's psychopathic. Yeah. But these like, people are, like, when you become that obsessed with politics in, you can't help yourself. You just you can't, and you need you need everyone around you to agree. You need your family to yeah. agree. You like, have to have, you, they you, have to agree. It comes yes. on like a fever that you can't <laughs> shake. And I've been radicalized. I was radicalized once or a couple of times, actually. I'd love to be radicalized. I tried yeah. on every few years. You're <laughs> out there something protesting Alito. I move on. No, I was, no, I haven't been radicalized in that way for a while. The, whoa, I just saw a bolt of lightning strike a building and smoke is now coming up. For the first time, I was radicalized uh, in high school by libertarians. Then I became radicalized by Marxists in college, like r radicalized in a different direction. Then I became radicalized again in my early 20s by anarcho-capitalists, which are like the purest form of libertarians. Um, I was already like, I was more, mo like I, I got out of the Marxism stuff very fast. It was like a six month period. It was like some kids dye their hair blue. I was a Marxist. We don't talk about it. 
Um, but the, the sort of purer form of intellectual libertarianism came later and that was very radical. Like I was a difficult person to be around, I would say. Like I was <laughs> not accepting of other people's opinions. Um, I, was, I was radicalized in college against consumerism. And I was like, do you guys remember Adbusters? Yes. Cons consumer con yeah. Consumerism was like the the number one evil thing for like two years in around <laughs> 2001. It was like consumerism is really bad. It's the worst thing ever. You were a big thrift store guy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I was a thrifter. That's for sure. Sajid, have you ever been yeah. radicalized? Oh, yeah. I mean, I was really radical i actually went to an indoctrination camp when i was in high school like a social justice indoctrination camp called, i mean it was sort it of like that, was meant, it? it wasn't called an indoctrination camp but it was meant to sort of like inculcate quote unquote south asian youth with leftist ideals <laughs> um and it was mm. this like insane sort of summer camp um but that yeah i mean i was just pretty you wanted to do or your parents like I don't know. You can cut no, this I mean, I guess I found out about it and kind of wanted to go. Um, and it was like in New Jersey at this somewhat cool forest, foresty area. Um, met some of the most insane people <laughs> I've ever met in my life. Um, but yeah, I mean, I was pretty, I, I think leftism was just like in the air in, you know, Philly in the 2000s, 2010s. Um, yeah, I was. I actually went to the women's march. <laughs> so what did you, I, 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 <laughs> I had a lot. I have a lot of friends who went to the women's march. That was still. Um, it was. There was still an expectation. I think I couldn't even make fun of it. Really, even among my friends, it was like very. I was politely disagreeing with a lot of people, and it's like I'm like I can't make fun of this at all. Like they're wearing the pink hats like come on like i can't yeah. say anything about this and people would give me they were like this is an important moment for women in this country and i was like all right off you go to the to the women's put your hat on to the women's march like it was very crazy the blm thing was even crazier where i had a lot of friends even like donating and um to an organization that is now not our topics today but i mean just falling apart it's like one controversy after another i think people are definitely going to go to prison wild so you went to the way i don't think women's march is a radical thing though i feel like women's march was a mass it's move. it wasn't a radical thing but i think it was just the kind of like stupid uh sort of sjw type thing that because the women's march was was premised on this idea that like somehow women were going to face this like historic takeaway of their rights and i know that roe was overturned and you know <sighs> whatever but i i i think that the hysteria around the women's march where it was like women are going to have all their all their rights stripped of them and and all this stuff was kind of the the motivating animus and that's why i think it was i don't know if i totally bought into it at the time but i was certainly like saying the right slogans at the event it's we're seeing a shadow of or a glimmer of that now with all these kids who are at these like muslim prayer things in in, in uh, support of yeah Palestine, which is always, this is really the way of Palestine, um, or not really of Palestine, but of, of like Muslim conversion. Every evangelical faith does it a little bit differently. The Christians bring you in um, with their fake rock music and their fun little, uh, you know, 4-H club or whatever. The Muslims are like, come to our angry left-wing protest. And everyone's like, yeah, we're mad about stuff. And they're like, and let's stop for prayers, right? And you're white and you don't want to be racist, so you better do it. And then everyone just fucking does it. <laughs> it's crazy. It, and it always works. This is this is literally like there's a name for it in France, this like Islamo leftism, basically, that they talk about this alliance between like actual Islamists, theocrats and socialists. Uh, and it's basically the premise of of how like the theocratic Muslim party gets to power in in submission by Welbeck. But I do think it's true. And you actually see it. You see it mostly in Europe now, like in England. I think they've just elected some uh, local politicians basically on the Palestine issue who seem to be explicitly aligned with like Islamist parties, but it wouldn't be surprising to me if it starts happening in the U S uh, at some well, point. Well, you'll definitely get it up in Minnesota, maybe Michigan. I think at the, it'll, I guess it'll be interesting to see I think you need a lot more Muslims in the country for it to have real power. I can't imagine a Karen 
like a sort of classically presenting Karen, <laughs> really accepting Muslim dominance, it seems strange, but then so have the last 10 years. So I guess we'll see in a few more. Um, speaking of all sides are relevant, I guess we weren't speaking about that and I don't believe in it, but we should talk about someone who does. Uh, something pretty funny, ha- funny, interesting, important, some would say, happened this week in the world of media. And that was Vivek, uh, who had already, I believe, amassed an eight point, maybe two something percent stake in BuzzFeed, announced his intentions for the company or his hopes for the company, let's say, but it was really his intentions for the company. He's now, I think, the second largest shareholder in the company. And he outlined a whole long thing on X where he sort of explains in his mind what went wrong with media and then outlines a path forward for BuzzFeed. It's incredibly arrogant. Uh, I don't think he's ever, I don't think you have to have had worked in media. I think that you should have like thought about it before today. And the things he outlined are dated, frankly. So uh, the big three are, um, one, we got to be doing AI generated content uh, or be using AI tools to be creating more content. Uh, two, doing more stuff with creators. That's the future of media. And three, we're going to tell the truth is how he frames it, but also diversity of thought. Um, so all three of, first of all, BuzzFeed sort of famously, infamously has already been doing AI generated content. This is like they're letting people go. They're talking about the future of AI generated content. I have, we've all talked about AI generated content and tools for AI generated content. It's not clear to me that how they can even be used at, at this moment. I think they will be used. I'm not sure what that looks like in this current media landscape. Very excited about it, but it's a conversation we've been having for years. And certainly BuzzFeed, to give them some credit, they've been doing more than I have. Like we're a media startup and we're not using these tools nearly as much. Well, I, you know what? I know they talk about it a lot. I'm not sure exactly what they've been doing. But one kind of stale conversation. Two would be the creator economy. Like we're talking about the creator economy in 2024. I mean, Taylor Lorenz invented the creator economy, and that was like five years ago, right? I mean, it was a long time ago. The cre- the idea that the cre- that creators are important in media, and we should do more with that in media, is not only no longer an interesting idea. It has been proven out by companies like Substack, where most of this has been litigated over the past four years. And it's not like these these big companies aren't aware of these trends. Like everyone is is trying to basically um, survive as a media company in a world with no ad revenue, which has been completely swallowed up by companies like Google, two companies really, Google and Facebook. Um, that's the the tension. It's been like this for a long time. We all know what the tension is. There are different, much smaller audiences that you can try and reach and shape and um, find interesting ways to sell to them. But we're not gonna we're not gonna AI generate and influence economy our way to a new media model here. In fact, those things are not new. And then finally, three all sides are worth talking to and. We should be honest. We should tell the truth. <laughs> Telling the truth and got to hear both sides are not the same thing. Okay. They're totally different things. In fact, do you have a perspective on the world or not? Um, if you're telling your perspective and if you're searching for the truth, there that there's that's you presumably believe there is a truth to tell. Like, why would you have a, there's not like a second, a third, a fourth, a fifth opinion on it. It's not like all sides are relevant. Um, So I just think that these two concepts are sort of fundamentally at odds. And so if you want to go the take of like, let's listen to everybody, which was popular among sort of like the IDW again, I think what, five, six years ago, um, that's going to get, in my opinion, pretty boring, pretty fast. That was really interesting back when people weren't allowed to talk. Uh, back then when the IDW was first forming and talking about it. But today the Overton window has sufficiently broadened to the point where you can no longer talk about talking. You have to say something compelling. And that kind of relates back to position two, the sort of influencers who are working and driving media forward. My take on this is the people who succeed in media today are biased and sort of own their bias and you know what their perspective is and that builds trust and trust is the thing that's lacking right now not the truth like the the truth 
how do you get to the truth? Do I, I don't believe that Vivek, who's a political candidate, for, was five seconds ago is telling me the truth. I think he's, I think he has an agenda, which is actually fine. Everybody has an agenda to some degree. But once you tell me that you're not giving me an agenda, but you're just giving me the truth, I don't fucking trust you. And you already failed at the new media game. What was your, your make of, uh, of really any of this, I guess media trends generally, but I'm interested in this Buzzfeed play in particular because it's pretty widely celebrated and I'm, I don't like to make a lot of predictions. I think this is going to fail. This is not going to work for him. Yeah, I guess my take is I, I'm like confused. I'm mostly thinking about like what Vivek's motives are. Does he actually want to get a seat on the board of the company or, you know, be gets, get a position on the C-suite? Um, I, I noticed that in his memo or letter to BuzzFeed, he carves out this whole section in his letter to essentially just criticize BuzzFeed for having published the Steele the Steel dossier and some of the other reporting that they did at the time that didn't actually pan out to be totally truthful. Like I don't know if that's normal for letters like these, but it just it, it seemed strange to me that he's, you know, he's like um, nominally, you know, like suggesting a lot of you know, business strategy in this, in this email, but, but really he's just, he's just like trying to, I feel like he's just trying to put points on the board for I agree. Trump or something with this letter. And that's all it is. Like, I don't, he was just trashing the media. But yeah. again, that's like another thing that is old, right? Trump was doing it in 2016. Um, years later, this is like, you have niche versions of this. You have this war between the tech press and the tech industry in throughout COVID, right? Years ago, four years ago. Um, I don't understand. It's like he hasn't been... I'm getting Bill Ackman from this. Yeah. Like I've been living in a cave for four years, five years, <laughs> and now I'm going to show up and tell you something that you already know and no longer matters. He, he also suggests... He, he suggests something that I think BuzzFeed did and led to their downfall sort of which was he's like what what if you guys get all these different youtube content creators and just take a portion of their money that they would normally make from youtube You're like that's basically the suggestion and it's like dude he, they can just go to youtube for that you, you realize like that's literally an ad rev share like you get a portion of the advertising that youtube gets uh on your videos i guess he's saying you know <laughs> you, we're going to you're going to leverage the brand of buzzfeed to grow and it's like, do you not think that's what media people are doing at the New York Times and at CNN and all these other places? Like, what do you think is happening? And the simple answer is he just has no idea. He just doesn't like the way the press covered him. And so his assumption is, you know, well, I guess it's just, it's bad for all these reasons me and my friends talk about in our group chats. And they just haven't talked to a media person who's obsessed with this. And it's like, they're, they're, they're right that media is fucked and it's not just fucked. It's not, it's not just, it's not just ideologically. It's like the model is totally not good. Um, and if you're going to succeed Buzzfeed, so it's easy for pirate wires to succeed, right? We're starting from zero and we're growing in the new, the new, new media landscape. Um, a company like Buzzfeed, which was worth billions of dollars, now has to somehow recover in a world where ad revenue can no longer be relied on like that. They used to consistently garner more traffic than anybody else on the internet. They were incredible at this. And um, that just now that the internet is Google, Facebook, like these, these portals that you go to discover things, um, that gravy train has sort of ended. I guess they were using those windows actually before when it was like freer to, to do that. So they were really capitalizing on like Facebook's free traffic for years and years and years. And that's just over. But I, I again, like I don't know how, first of all, obviously none of the things that Vivek said are going to help, but I don't know what could possibly help. Um, if you're trying to build something like what we thought was possible in the early 2000s when again the traffic was free and it's like until that changes media companies are going to look a lot different and it's just the way it's going to be i think that there are probably interesting things coming um weird things like 
uh, sort of, it's a media company, but it's also a private club and it's like a media company, but it's also yeah. a football team. It's a media company, but it's also a venture capital firm, like that kind of stuff where the media is like integrated into other stuff um, and maybe even sprawling in some, I don't know what the conglomerate huge version of that looks like. It'll be weird though. Like the, the rules of, 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 uh, of the information ecosystem now are incredibly weird. They're weirder than they were a while ago. Um, you're not going to get by with an old world strategy plus AI um, and like the creator economy. It doesn't work that way. Yeah, I was going to say, I was when I was reading his letter, I kept thinking about your interview with Jack Dorsey, actually. And just like, how would this BuzzFeed that's basically on one hand pumping out like AI slop content, it sounds like, which is sort of giving <laughs> both sides perspectives and and probably doesn't have honestly that much of an audience uh, these days because <clears throat> people already sort of like it's cheap and easy to get the actual facts of what's happening. Um, but, you know, people are looking for analysis, I think, in a lot of cases. Uh, and then also has, I guess, this like diverse, quote unquote, uh, all sides collection of creators that they're syndicating. Um, what does that look like in a world where, you know, you potentially have like a decentralized platform that people are opting into on the basis of their you know, wanting to find like-minded people or that kind of thing. Uh, and I do think that in that world, you're increasingly going to see people attracted to, as you're saying, like brands driven by a very strong, very clearly stated perspective and bias that people are owning and that allows you to opt into a smaller community of like-minded people. Because I think everyone's just exhausted by this kind of like global town square um, that we we currently have uh, on social media and increasingly looking to like group chats, signal chats, whatever, smaller sort of more self-selected spaces. Uh, and I think that's probably where media will be heading in the next 10 years. Yeah, I completely agree, especially on that other. And I don't quite know how that snaps in, how the group chat thing snaps in, how the private gated community thing snaps in. It's hard to wrap your head around because everything in business and media, so like tech and media, but business generally over the last 20 years has been how do you scale to enormous levels, right? And now things that are working are subscription-based. So you still want scale there, but then also the rise of like private groups and um, private clubs and things. Uh, I don't quite know. I, I can sort of feel us kind of approaching this, but I don't think we've seen a really banger example of this just yet. And it's certainly the opposite of what BuzzFeed was, which didn't die because I think I think conservatives really want to believe that BuzzFeed died because they were woke. And that is just really stupid. That's like a very dumb thing to say out loud. It's not what happened. Like the all media died because of the model. It does not, that model no longer works. It's very simple. And for a businessman, he that's his whole thing, right? He's like a less good version of Trump. So it's like business based businessman. You've got to know that. You have to know that that thing failed for that reason. And until you figure out a new model, I don't know what to tell you, but it's certainly not like, oh, we're not going to be doing woke content anymore. First of all, there are plenty of people who love woke content. Like threads did not die. It's still, they're all out there talking about nonsense. Like there are going to be places where people disseminate woke content and, you know, make a living off of it. Probably. I don't want to meet those people, but they're out there. It's hard to know, like, what will, what will, like, what will the typical business model for media be in five years? But it's really easy to know that it won't be driven by super high volumes of clicks. And thus, like the, the business models just won't be reliant on programmatic advertising. That's what that's like the the easiest thing to do to, to, to monetize a business that's getting lots of traffic is just to slap programmatic programmatic ads on your site. And that's how you make money. That's just not gonna happen anymore. Ironically, in part because the media went on a 10 year long you know, sort of campaign against Facebook for, you know, making the world a horrible place and um, blaming them for like misinformation in the election of Donald Trump. And so they shut the spigot off of, um, 
of all the page views that they were sending to these sites that were shitting on them. So like there's a part of this where it's like you kind of play, st- play stupid games, win super prizes thing. I'm not saying that's exactly why this whole thing happened, but um, I'm sure that the future of media will not be programmatic ads because there will just not be high volume clicks like that will just not happen anymore um, for uh, for any anybody but a select few who have extreme brand recognition, millions and millions of email addresses to send their content to, um, which is just going to be like the top, top, top 1%, including New York Times. I think they'll always be able to rely on tons of traffic. But I don't even know if they... And, and Pirate Wires, of course, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, I want to talk about the trillion dollar paint job. So, uh, Sanjay, why don't you break this one down for us? Pete Buttigieg um, got into a little bit of hot water, I believe it was last weekend on Face the Nation, over electric vehicle charging stations, which opens up really like a whole world of things that I want to talk about. But why don't you break down the story for us? Yeah. So, basically, Pete goes, Mayor Pete goes on uh, Face the Nation and is asked by this journalist very straightforwardly um, about this new report that's come out of the Federal uh, Highway Association, I think it's called, the the, the Federal Organization that basically um, monitors and runs highways. Uh, and this organization found that in the past three years after the $1.2 trillion bipartisan infrastructure bill was passed by the Biden administration, which allocated $7.5 billion to the construction of EV chargers. Only seven to eight EV chargers have actually been built. And so the interviewer asks Pete Buttigieg, you know, how is it possible that you guys received $7.5 billion to build these EV chargers and you've built fewer than 10? The Federal Highway Administration says only seven or eight Charging stations have been produced with a seven and a half billion investment that taxpayers made back in 2021. Why isn't that happening more quickly? So the president's goal is to have half a million chargers up by the end of this decade. Now, in order to do a charger, it's more than just plunking a a, a small device into the ground. There's utility work. And this is also uh, really a new category of federal investment. But we've been working with each of the 50 states. Every one of them is getting formula dollars to do this work, engaging them and the first handful, again, by 2030, 500,000 chargers and the very first handful of chargers are now already being physically built. This obviously blows up because it's it is a pretty shocking clip where he he offers no no meaningful explanation for this like huge, I guess, shipping delay or like implementation delay uh, in these chargers. And um, and, you know, for context, Tesla has over 2,500 EV chargers currently in North America. They've got over 400 in California alone. They've got 50,000 worldwide. Uh, so it's it's not as if no one knows how to build an EV charger quickly. I mean, I think I was looking up online uh, that Tesla nowadays can build some EV chargers in seven to 10 days. Um, so it's like this really shocking incompetence, I guess, on the part of the federal government. So to give them a little bit a, the sh- tiniest shred of a defense here. Part of this is just the procurement process. Um, I covered this bill a bit, a lot. I mean, I wrote a lot about this, but when the chips bill came around, um, I I really did like an exhaustive reading of everything to get a sense of what actually goes into the bill, how it's divided out, like what is the timeline here? And everything is give it out in chunks. First of all, like you don't even get all seven point whatever billion. Um, it's divided regionally. You get it over. It's like every, I, I believe it's like, it might be, it's in quarters. And I, I don't, I'm not sure what the period of time is, but 70, over 75% of it wouldn't have even have been allocated at this point. Um, still, what the seven chargers, that means some of it's being allocated bill, at least a couple billion and they're not able to do it. That's a huge problem. I would say it's not nearly as big of a problem as the fact that $1.2 trillion was spent on infrastructure. And when I first read through that disaster, the charging stations were the thing that I liked the most. That I thought, 
that's a paltry, you know, seven billy in 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 one point two trillion. Uh, but at least it's a physical change to the world. There is some kind of a vision there. I don't know if it's the correct vision, and I'm sure people are going to be blowing up our comments saying gas is the only way. And I think there's an interesting argument for that. Actually, I under- there's a lot on electric vehicles that I think is a little bit complicated. But it is certainly a vision of of the world that we're going to have electric cars, and we're going to need electric uh, vehicle charging stations. And so to do that, we need them all across the country, this big, huge gesture. It's going to be jobs, and we're going to really change the way that Americans drive. I think at least that's something, right? There's at least there's at least a somewhat of a strategy. There's certainly um, an end destination, and then they're just failing at it, which, of course, they fail at everything. But the rest of the bill, uh, we're talking like over half of this thing is just total bullshit, just like random grants to random organizations to study random aspects of the country. There was stuff in there on equity grants that I had read. You can go and just look at, this was a huge, now it's being discussed because obviously everybody runs to defend Pete after this interview and they're like, oh, well, there's so much infrastructure. I got into a little bit with, um, what's his face from Axios, Conrad, is it Con- No, no. Who is it from, uh, from Axios? Primic. Um, who was like, you know, I see a lot of infrastructure here. There's almost no infrastructure. There's no new bridge being built. It's literally paint. There's new paint being put on different buildings. There are uh, refurbishments of this or that random port. There's nothing being created, nothing being paved that has never been paved before. It's all just stuff we've already done and actually invented from scratch for less money. $1.2 $1.2 trillion is more adjusted for inflation than the Manhattan Project, the Apollo Project, and the interstate highway system combined. Okay, Those are three totally transformative projects in the history of America that cost less than this combined. What are we getting? It's just really crazy. And there's no accountability at all. Of course, they're failing on one of the few bright spots. Um, but the bigger failure is the stuff that we're never going to hear about because there was never anything promised in the first place. It was just, we're going to give money to this random Democrat in the middle of the country who we want to vote for us. And that's just a crime, in my opinion. I think the chips bill is better, but a different topic. Um, than, it's still bad, like largely bad. Uh, but there are chunks of it that are really good, I think, or better than, than usual. I don't know, Brandon, what do you make of this? I was just doing some research before the podcast. And it looks like SpaceX has probably been funded to about three or four billion dollars total, and they've they're sending more payload to orbit than the rest of the world combined. That is right now crazy. Or, that is a crazy way, bucks. yeah, to think to frame it. That is crazy, and, and yeah. they're landing rockets. Yeah, they're reusing. It's not like you can't do stuff with money, right? Right. It's not even like right. the government can't do stuff with money. So Tesla, you know, you mentioned Sanji. I think we're coming out that at, at this. Like I have numbers around Tesla too, Sanji. There's a distinction, distinction between chargers and stations. So my stats, so I, I have 6,000 stations worldwide that Tesla's put up. So 50,000 chargers, let's say. Um, and it's hard to find the numbers on this, but that probably costs between $1 and $2 billion for Tesla. 6,000 stations. Um, Microsoft funded OpenAI with 10 billion bucks and they haven't even given it all to OpenAI. It's like given it's given out in tranches and we all know what OpenAI did. They created an AI that literally passes the Turing test. This is like the Manhattan project for the AI, for AI. Um, and it's not even maybe with 10 more, billion maybe bucks. It's a funding before that. Let's say, you know, let's say I'm not sure what the funding was totally before. That was certainly a huge round and it was like the work was kind of done at that point. I would say maybe it's even a better case to be made because they would have taken way less funding before that when they did most of it. They they were paying Microsoft for what compute, right? A lot of the a lot of the funding just goes to compute, <laughs> and not to like employees and stuff. But yeah, I just wanted to I just wanted to highlight the this you know it's just like obviously you can get stuff you can get stuff done. It's not impossible, but it's not happening with the government, of course. Physical things are harder, but not that hard, right? I mean, Robert Moses you can, did it. <laughs> Well, you have to like, be you have to be you have to be Moses. willing to to like piss some people off. Um, if you want real infrastructure, Robert Moses is the guy to look to, right? I mean, we're talking about huge highway projects. Just that neighborhood's in the wrong spot. Sorry, guys, gotta go. <laughs> We've yeah. got we have an on ramp to build. <laughs> have you, have you guys um, read the entire what would, what power would, broker? Sorry, 
I've re- I read about half of the Power Broker before. I was like, I think I I've read like twenty percent. I still haven't got. Yeah, there. yeah, I've read a bit of it. Um, I always think like, what would Robert Moses do if put on the Planning Commission in San Francisco? Like <laughs> nothing, because he wouldn't be empowered to do it. You needed real. He has to have authority to do the kinds of things that he wants. And we are frozen in amber, in amber right? Every single city in the country is frozen because of the power that is given to people to resist change. And that's good in some ways, right? There are some changes that are bad that everybody famously hates, but it also just makes progress impossible. Um, I don't think it would make, you know, building a bridge or something impossible that needs to be built. That, especially when you are the actual government and you're like writing the check for it and there's the local governments on your side and you need the bridge, you're not paving anything over. The problem there is just everything costs more money. So the just if you look at just the cost of rail, right, the, the cost to build the subway in New York, again, adjusted for inflation is so much higher than it was that separate from all of this, just people don't want things to change. I guess the social dynamic there that, that, that has frozen us in place, it's just, yeah, it's like union money. It is the cost of labor. It is um, government regulations. And so we're kind of just stuck. So I, I would really just for the infrastructure, it would have been cool if they paired it with, I don't know, some kind of like, if you're using this money to build like an infrastructure bill approved project, you get this sort of Mario bouncing star thing that makes you immune from government regulation and you can just go ham. Like you you just, you just build the thing. The EPA no longer applies to you for a period of like a month or two months. Wow. So give, give them six months. Um, Zoning laws gone. Uh, let's say, what is it? Community review abolished forever. It's just your building. Just it's it is uh, off you go with a billy to build a bridge. Would it even cost that? I don't know. I forget what did someone want, Brandon? Can you look up what the cost to build the Golden Gate Bridge was? I'm looking. I don't know what the cost is, but I was looking. So we have an article called 12 Epic Feats of American Engineering," and the Golden Gate Bridge is one of them. It was completed ahead of schedule and under budget, though uh, the board of supervisors at the time opposed it. Always bad. Yeah, <laughs> always bad. The They've Sierra, always been bad. The Sierra Club opposed it, and like local fi- sh- local ferry and shipping businesses were like, "No, this is going to hurt our bottom line. It's not happening." The lead engineer Joseph Strauss, he hired a political fixer who like worked for like months to like basically just bribe everybody to get this thing going. And it ended up taking, and it, it, it was done 16 years after it was first proposed. Um, but most of the, most of the issues were bureaucratic and not like they weren't trying to figure out the laws of physics. You know, they, they had, they had the technology, they knew how to build the bridge. Um, but how much does it cost? I don't know. Uh, well, so it was 35 million in, in, 1937, um, but adjusted for inflation, that's less than $700 million in 2024 dollars, which I will say is less than the homeless department in San Francisco gets <laughs> annually. Per year. Uh, <laughs> per year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so basically, um, yeah, if we just... <laughs> that's fucking crazy. <laughs> we just took, took their what, budget for one year. That's... If, if we were to, to just build only Golden Gate Bridges with the $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill, we could build 1,714 Golden Gate Bridges. We would have more Golden Gate Bridges <laughs> than you could... I don't even know. Could even ima- I'd never even imagined that many Golden Gate Bridges before, but that's we how would, many we could have we would if be we were actually building the bridges. Golden Gate bridges. We would definitely be the country with the most. <laughs> there, no one, we would have the best... The most, the best. Donald Trump would have so much more to brag about yeah. if we had 1,700 yeah, Golden Gate bridges. But instead, what we have is seven electric vehicles charging stations, which is honestly a crime so unfathomable that I think that we have a hard time grasping it. It's it's actually a robbery so extreme that there is no way to really understand the magnitude of it because our brain is not built to comprehend a scale that large. It's just not how we're wired. And so they're getting away with with really like a shocking level of this has to be, a, it's fraud, right? Um, I was I tweeted the other day, I, I, I don't, I would have less of a problem with fraud if everything worked. 
um, or even most things work, right? Like I would have less of a problem with fraud. Brandon, you were describing bribery. I would have less of a problem with bribery if it meant that we got Golden Gate Bridges, but it doesn't mean that anymore. Now, now we don't get anything and random people, it's not even like our politicians are that rich. I mean, yeah, Nancy Pelosi's stock market, but like, where's the actual money going? It's not even going to the politician's pocket. It's not like straight up theft. It's going to all of their friends. It's going to the nonprofits. It's bleeding into like random people to do work that never happens. Like we saw for the, what is it? The high-speed rail situation or in New York during the subway, the second Avenue subway line where people are billing hours that they could not possibly have worked. Um, that's in every single corner of the country. And it is a goddamn shame. And probably nothing's going to be done about it ever. <laughs> like no one's going to answer <laughs> for this. It's just, we have to just change the way we think about it. That's the only way. People have to just really be like, no, we need infrastructure and we need to empower people to do it. And this sort of pure democracy for every single aspect of our world thing that we've been doing for the last few decades has just crippled us and allowed the worst people alive to seize power. Um, to, who, the kind of people who really flourish in these socially chaotic situations. Um, and that's, yeah, we're at the mercy of them. Nothing changes. I feel like it'd be cool if these kind of infrastructure projects came with like iconic uh, buildings or statues or something that like somehow could be voted on uh, or there was some sort of like competitive bidding process to build some some kind of like I don't know, some monument that would be representative of this like supposedly once in a generation uh, investment instead of just, you know, this stuff that most people aren't like these EV chargers and this, you know, repainting buildings and stuff that most people aren't even going to notice. Um, I think that would kind of reinvigorate people's interest in like the built environment and caring about the aesthetics and quality of you know, buildings and monuments that go up and infrastructure and all that kind of stuff. We don't, yeah, it's, I don't think, we don't really build memorable monuments in this country anymore. I always say that I would really love a gladiator. Why don't we have one of those? One of the giant, the gi or the Colossus, I'm sorry, the Colossus. It should be in the San Francisco Bay. It's the perfect place to have it. Just a giant, people always say it should be the justice, uh, you should call it the justice statue. So you have liberty and justice on the coasts. It would be epic to have because justice is very not San Francisco, right? But it would make sense <laughs> if it was on Alcatraz Island or something. And he's just a giant colossus, like with a sword, looking very like I'm gonna fuck shit up if it tries to invade. Um, that would be cool. But I would accept just like a very well built, I think a male, since isn't the Statue of Liberty a woman? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think that would be fair to, to make it a man. That'll never happen in today's environment. Um, but would be cool to see like a jacked dude on Alcatraz. I mean, imagine the things that we could build if I were in charge. Uh, speaking of San Francisco, Sajana, you need to take me through this sort of haunted hellscape that is Prop C. Uh, now, you know, in retrospect, one of the great policy failures of the modern era. Yeah, I mean, uh, so... You wrote about this salon a few months ago. Prop C was this uh, this bill that passed um, in San Francisco in 2018, which basically levied an additional gross receipts tax on businesses generating over $50 million uh, in gross receipts uh, annually and allocated all of the proceeds to homeless services. And so the idea at the time was that, you know, San Francisco has this seemingly intractable homeless crisis. We've tried to fund it to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars over the past decade. That hasn't worked. So maybe if we just throw a couple more hundreds of millions of dollars at the problem, we'll have fewer homeless people uh, on the streets. And uh, as you might expect, that didn't work out. And there's new data that's just come out of the Department of Homelessness and Supportive Housing that shows that homelessness, total homelessness is up 7%. Uh, over the past two years and has risen since 2019. And in general, there's basically been no dent. Uh, and if anything, you know, the numbers have, have just increased uh, over the past decade. Um, so that's kind of the, the context for Prop C. The, the promise was homelessness is going to be reduced. It wasn't reduced. Um, but the piece that we published this week looks at the measure from a slightly different angle, which is kind of a sort of 
tech slash business story angle, um, because one of the more interesting dimensions of the Prop C debate was who supported it. Um, you had Mark Benioff, the CEO of Salesforce, who apparently because of a phone call with this <laughs> crazy socialist, which Solana, you get into in your piece, uh, Doom Loop that you published a few months ago, which I encourage people to, to read because that really breaks down the like insane like human dynamics behind uh, <laughs> Benioff's decision to to go all in on Prop C. But basically, Benioff was convinced to support this gross receipts tax and went on this war campaign uh, where he was writing op-eds in the New York Times and talking to CNN and going to rallies and basically haranguing any and all tech executive who came out and, and spoke against Prop C. Uh, and, you know, Benioff, of course, is, is head of a software, uh, an S S A A S company, um, Salesforce. And the people who spoke out, the people in the tech world who spoke out against prophecy most, um, I don't want to say vociferously, but they spoke out like the most, the, the strongest against it were people like Jack Dorsey and Patrick Collison, uh, who worked at payment processing companies. And, what they tried to explain to people um, is that Prop C would kind of disproportionately affect a lot of payment processing companies. Um, and this had to do with several reasons, some of which are kind of technical and they had to do with like San Francisco's gross receipts tax uh, was higher for companies that were classed as financial service companies than for companies that were classed as information technology companies. Um, and, Within those categories, you also had the payroll tax being calculated differently. And I sort of get into the, the details of this in the piece. Um, but I think people's eyes glazed over as soon as Jack Dorsey was making this point publicly and saying, you know, Stripe, which is, or not Stripe Square, um, which is now called Block, which is like four times smaller than, than, uh, Salesforce is going to be paying potentially double the amount that Salesforce would pay, uh, if this measure passes. Um, you know, people sort of ignored it and the measure ended up passing. And then you had this tremendous exodus of, of payment processing fintech companies and tech companies more generally from the city, some of which probably had to do with COVID, I'll grant, but a lot of which had to do with, with Prop C. So you had, um, you know, we, we sort of laid out in the article, but, uh, Stripe left, Square left the city, um, Credit Karma moved to to Oakland. Tons of fintech companies leased, leased office space in the city, um, and it you know tech tech jobs cratered. They're down like fourteen thousand uh, in the past year, I think, uh, in in SF and San Mateo County. So, um, yeah, it it really just basically sacrificed San Francisco's sort of burgeoning fintech industry for a homeless promise that never <laughs> came true. There's always a homeless pop, uh, promise that never comes true. I've, I moved to San Francisco in 2011 and every ballot, I feel there was something about homeless on there. And every time it was like, we're going to solve it with the following things and the things were always more money. But Prop C was unique and it was in the, what you framed is correctly. I mean, it's, you, the piece, it was great. Um, it was enormous. It was an enormous amount of money. It, it, it is more money than has ever been raised in San Francisco for homelessness. Um, and that really became a conversation about whether or not you care about homeless people or you don't. And there was it was a total witch burning situation. It was not like now. People really are, I think it's hard to explain to people who didn't live through it how different the climate was in like 2019 in San Francisco than today. And we have maybe the opposite idea that things are worse now than ever before. And they're better now than I can remember than ever before in terms of being able to speak your mind, uh, certainly in San Francisco. And this is like on this issue, who is defending Prop C at this point? Nobody. But on all political issues, I mean, today we see like David Sachs is joking about the Trump fundraiser that he's throwing and it's fine and people are laughing and many disagreeing, but it's that when Peter endorsed Trump, it was as if he had murdered someone worse, raped someone, raped and killed someone because he was like run out of town. It was just a complete witch burning. The climate was very, very, very different. And in that climate, which was you know uniquely hostile to people with any kind of divergent view on 
really like a left wing orthodoxy. Um, Patrick Collison and Jack Dorsey were like really viciously attacked. One of our commenters was like, I, I had to walk by picket lines to get into my building at Stripe. <laughs> um, it was wild. And Mark Benioff is one of the big reasons it was wild. He was writing op-eds. He was attacking these people online. He was ginning everybody up. And and he was, you know, the billionaire who made it valid. He said, you know, I'm a billionaire and I'm paying more tax. And that's all he, he just kept hammering that point again and again and again. Um, it is credit. I'm not sure if it's like, did he know what he was doing? Is he really just that stupid? It's you can't really tell with him. It could he could authentically just be that dumb. Uh, but the damage has been considerable and there have been no consequences. No one goes back. No one says, remember when you said that homelessness would be solved and that's what justified your behavior and your sort of total maligning of these people and you're driving all of fintech out of the city. What happened to that? Where did the money go? Do you take it back? Do you apologize? Like, are you going to fight to reverse it? Of course not. We just move on. And that's the kind of thing that's the maybe the worst. It's worse than even these these disaster policies is that we don't revisit them. It's like almost, I, I wonder if it's not worth just baking into every single piece of legislation, some kind of two-year review where you check in and see how it's going. And if it's totally the opposite of what you intended, then it just automatically nullifies the bill or something. And all the future money that was marked to be spe- paid back is just like, or to be spent on the on the, on the the task is given away and you start over. Um, certainly people who are responsible for the legislation should have some kind of skin in the game. Like, why is nobody who who supported that on the board of supervisors answering for it. Um, and I think they should probably answer for it with their job when it's something that, that that's that big. You should just be automatically fired. It's like another, it's like a trigger. Like, okay, great. You're going to solve homelessness. So zero homelessness, let's just say you have it. Is that maybe, maybe you divide by 75% less homelessness, let's say. If that's the goal and you don't hit it, you automatically lose your job and your sort of number two steps up temporarily until there's an emergency vote or something. Because there, there just have to be, I don't know how we persist in this world of just failed policy after failed policy and more money printed after more money printed and nothing gets better, it has to change eventually, right? Like there has to be a moment where we stop. I keep waiting for that moment. I don't know. Maybe that moment doesn't happen. Maybe people have just given up. It's, I feel like it's even more depressing than how you're describing it, Michael. Um, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> when they were talking about Prop C, the advocates were making a lot about, making a lot of noise about oversight and accountability of it they set up a committee uh, an oversight committee for these funds and number one it was full of conflicts of interest jennifer friedenbach was on it or is it is she still on it i don't know but for for those who don't know who that is she's the um the director or she's she's at the top of an organization called coalition on homelessness and this coalition basically sues the city anytime an encampment is cleared so like I'm not sure that person should be on this oversight committee that is... She also got on, money from it, didn't she? D- doesn't she get money from the government? Yeah, she's used she her authority it. to greenlight grants to her nonprofit, or at least that's what Sanji's... Reporting. How is that not a prison sentence? It's just crazy to me. So the and it second was cleared worst part, by the Board of Supervisors. <laughs> the so second, goes, to the, okay. goes to the checks they and all balances have to be in jail. Work. That's the only way we're getting out of this. The worst Everybody part, goes though, to prison. That the worst part, though, is so there. There is an oversight committee, but there was an audit of the home of the HSH that was published earlier this month. I think it was on May fourth, and it found that the HSH is not adequately tracking where it's spending its money. So, like we we did set up accountability, but then we did we didn't do it, and it was full of people who used it to funnel money into their own um, firms that use the money to increase homelessness <laughs> pretty much. Just like crazy. It's totally f-ed up. Sorry to swear. But. Well, I don't know how to solve it um, without installing a dictator. And because I'm not ready to advocate for that just yet, I think we're <laughs> going to call this episode today. Um <laughs> I want to end on something, I guess, like a moment of happiness for all of us, which is that Harvard University is now a mission first company. Um, Very quickly, because we're over time. Brandon, you want to break that story down for us? 
Yeah. So Harvard University um, put together in the wake of the October 7th attacks and all of the uh, sort of social turmoil on campus that happened, um, they they had a committee, essentially, it's called the Institutional Voice Working Group, look into this idea of whether or not Harvard as an institution should be making statements every time there's some kind of conflict and uh, should be taking a position on one or another side of that conflict. On Tuesday, the this working group recommended to Harvard that um, they should, should not do that. <laughs> they should basically not take sides. Um, and what they said was um, their, their logic, which is pretty sound, just kind of like no shit, but they said in, in issuing official statements of empathy, the university runs the risk of appearing to care more about some places and events than others. And because few, if any, world events can be entirely isolated from co- conflicting viewpoints, issuing official empathy statements runs the risk of alienating some members of the community by expressing implicit solidarity with others. So basically like they are, it's just not a good idea to do this is what they're saying. I mean, and, and it's Harvard, almost good. Harvard has, Harvard has responded to that or, or I guess saying that they will be taking this committee's, this working group's recommendations and will stop making statements about conflicts which are just like you know have nothing to do with harvard yeah which is almost explicitly what was outlined by brian armstrong in his mission first manifesto years ago for which he was brutally attacked by everybody in the press and the reason he was attacked was because they knew i think the reason the real reason is they looked at that decision to sort of not be involved in the politics of the world and, and they understood that it was the only way that any institution could survive. And so it represented the future. That was going to be every company was going to have to do this. It was, you were going to have to do this or dissolve because you were going to be eaten alive by crazy people who worked at your at your, at your your place of work. Um, and that is now, that was a trend in tech first, right? It's a totally table state. Not, I wouldn't say every tech company does it, but enough giants do it that you anyone is free to do it or free to fail really i mean google does it facebook does it most small companies do it certainly some of them have an unofficial like i mean every elon company does it but doesn't call it that it's just like if you're not working you're fired <laughs> so he's like maybe always done it but didn't call it anything um but brian really paved the way here in tech at least and tech paved the way for the rest of the country it looks like because once harvard's gone that trend is just over i don't know if next time around we're going to see johnson and johnson well, probably Johnson and Johnson will be making a B- another BLM statement, but I, I don't know that we'll see sort of more serious academic institutions. Um, I don't know that we'll be seeing uh, so any co- any like huge important companies. I th- I think, God, I'm going to look so stupid if I'm wrong about this, um, but I think things are a little bit better. I would say. I think you phrased it, Brandon. You said the Claudine Gay era of Harvard is over. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, MIT just banned diversity statements for hack- faculty hiring. That, that happened this month. Well, that was super egregious. That was not just, that was compelled speech. That was you standing up to get a job and saying, I accept the notion that my yeah, job is to <laughs> incorporate race into the way that I hire and structure my classes, like who I allow in to work with me. It, I will de- I will use race as a determining factor. It was it's crazy. Not only are they racist, they're demanding that you be racist or you don't hire. So yeah, you have to swear. Yeah, congratulations for getting rid of that. It's yeah. like University of Chicago get, has, has done it too. Stanford and Northwestern yes. have done this. So I think it's I'm the still same not as bullish in, on Harvard. <laughs> why? Why not? Because they had to get a fucking weird ass committee to tell them to do this obvious thing yeah. like why did they have to cite this insane cabal of consultants uh, it is funny to be like justifying this they're like listen the consultant said the consultants told us to do it and you know how it is in america when a mckinsey guy says <laughs> you gotta do something it is what it is sorry guys the blm shit's over the palestine shit really it's not the blm shit it's the palace. They're like, we got to stop this Palestine stuff. And it's very funny. And that's a whole other podcast about like why it was this one and specifically this one that they just could not tolerate after years of just like the most 
deranged insanity we've ever seen in public, but it was, and it's over, and I'm grateful for it. Thank you, Harvard University, for following in Brian Armstrong's footsteps. Um, as ever, the tech industry is happy to pave the way for reasonable people um, into the future. Rate, review, subscribe, tell all of your friends, and keep an eye out for some very sick Pirate Wire swag that will be coming your way like any moment now, possibly, within the next week, probably, but just keep your eyes peeled. Um, Moon should be a state. Later. <laughs>